Good morning and a happy Easter to you. As you can see behind me is the garden tomb in Jerusalem where many believe the events that we're celebrating today actually happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And the reason many believe this is the tomb that Jesus rose from is because it's close location to the place of the skull, which is the hill which the Bible tells us on which Jesus was crucified. And as you can see from this photograph, exactly why it got its name. It's an old photograph, but it does show clearly the skull outline on the face of it. And this is very nearby to the garden tomb. Well, today, I suppose, is one of the day, is the day when Christians celebrate more than at any other time of the year, because this is the day when Jesus Christ rose. And as Anglicans, one of the wonderful things is we are part of a worldwide communion of thousands upon thousands of us who today will be celebrating. And I thought before we begin our service this morning, wouldn't it be nice to see how some of those other Christians around the globe are celebrating the rise of Christ today. So let's now take a moment and join Christians from all over the world and see how they celebrate today. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The, the Lord, Lord is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. 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 Christ Jesus Christ Christ vive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tata Christus Shatawai Huatapat. Hallelujah. Christu Jesus Alleluia! Christo vivi! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Alleluia! Alleluia! Jesus Christo ressuscitou! Alleluia! Jesus Christo vivi! Alleluia! Glória a Deus! Alleluia! Cristo ressuscitou! Alleluia! Cristo vive! Cristo vos crês! Clarice vos crês! Alleluia! Alleluia! Aleluya, Cristo ha resucitado, aleluya. Aleluya. Aleluya, aleluya. Cristo resucitó. Cristo vive, aleluya. Aleluya, Cristo resucitó. Aleluya, Cristo vive. Cristo ressuscitou. Verdadeiramente, o Senhor ressuscitou. Aleluia! Thank you. 
Well, if that doesn't blow the cobwebs away, nothing will. Well, let's begin our service together now. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And let's begin by singing that wonderful resurrection hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. to begin with and we say together now almighty god to whom all hearts are open all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your holy spirit that we may perfectly love you 
and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, and on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Hear what comfortable words our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hear also what St Paul says. This is a true saying, and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Let us therefore confess our sins in penitence and faith. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we say together the Gloria. All glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now our collect for today, Easter Sunday, let us pray. Lord of all life and power, who through the mighty resurrection of your Son overcame the old order of sin and death to make all things new in him, grant that we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, may reign with him in glory, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be praise and honour, glory and might, now and in all eternity. Amen. God of glory, by the raising of your Son, you have broken the chains of death and hell. Fill your church with faith and hope, for a new day has dawned, and the way to life stands open in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And our readings for today, Easter Sunday. We're going to begin with a reading from the Epistle to the Corinthians, the first Epistle to the Corinthians, and we're going to read chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11. 
I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I hand it to you as of first importance what I in turn have received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we turn to our Gospel reading for today, and we're going to read from the Gospel of John. And we're going to read about the events of today as they took place 2,000 years ago from John 20, verses 1 to 18. John 20, 1 to 18. On the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, You've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings, wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' face, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now it's time for us to sing again, and we're going to sing another resurrection hymn. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son.
it's time for us to join Rob Grinsell in the church to learn more about these exciting events on the day that Jesus rose from the dead and what it all means. Well, we're going to look today at the resurrection of Christ in 1 Corinthians 15. It's a passage of, a passage of scripture that speaks powerfully about how we testify and speak of the resurrected power of Jesus Christ in our lives. The testimony that we can bring to others that Jesus is alive and that the evidence for that is in transformed lives. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that you would just speak to us through this passage of Scripture. Help us to understand the power that lies in the Word of God and how important it is for us to share this good news with those around us. Give us opportunity to do that, boldness in our spirits and hearts, but also, Lord, just enable us to speak the truth in love as we tell others that Jesus Christ is alive. And this day, this Easter day, is a day of celebrating that great truth. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Paul says, For what I received I passed on to you is of first importance. This is the very most important thing that you need to know, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. But I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect, though I worked harder than all of them, Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me, whether then it is I or they. This is what we preach. This is what you believed. Amen. Now Paul is writing this to the believers at Corinth. Corinth is a Greek city. And what's interesting here is that the Greeks did not believe in resurrection. In fact, when Paul first preached the resurrection of Jesus in Athens, they laughed at him. Greek philosophers regarded the human body as a prison, and death was welcome. It was freedom from its limitations. So Corinth, as a city, did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And amazingly enough, neither did many in the church at Corinth. I'm going to repeat that. Many of the believers in Corinth didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't even believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you can see why it's so important for Paul to write this to the Corinthian church. So Paul starts his argument with this fundamental truth, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And he basically says, I'm going to present to you three witnesses to that effect. I'm going to show you that there are three witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus so that you should believe in the one who is resurrected and is alive today. Well, the first one was the power of the cross. The power of the cross. He says in verse 3, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins. Tony Campolo refers to the, the old song that says, the old spiritual song, that asks the question, where were you when they crucified my Lord? Well, we may not have been there as spectators, but it was our sins that nailed Jesus to the cross. John Stott says, before we, begin, before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. In other words, we... We need, and we need to recognise that we need the sacrifice of Jesus and the cross of Jesus for our redemption. And it isn't until we see ourselves in need of the cross and the sacrifice of the Lord 
that we can truly benefit from all of its works. And so Paul writes, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you. I didn't come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is where the power lay. All the other things seemed to be arguments, but the power lay in the cross of Jesus. And Paul is saying that it's the, it's the cross of Jesus, it's the blood of Jesus that has the power to transform and change lives. And we see that so powerfully in, the Mar in Mark's account of the death of Jesus at um, Mark 15, verse 33. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone, they said. Let's see if Elijah comes down to take him. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The very last words that Jesus heard before he died was mockery. The mockery of those around him, the mockery of the religious leaders. The last thing that he, he listened to was the unbelief and the lack of faith from those who were watching him die. And then Jesus dies, and there's power in his death. There's power to transform lives. What's the first thing that is said after he died? We know what the last thing was before he died, the mockery of those around. But what was the first thing that was said after he died? Verse 38, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. That's the power of the cross. It's the power of Jesus, the power of his blood to transform people's lives, to turn those, those sounds of mockery into declarations of faith by those around him. And what Paul is saying to the Corinthians is, listen, the very power of the cross, the blood of Jesus, which has the power to transform and to change lives and to enable us to believe in Jesus, this is the first testimony that I can give you, that Jesus Christ is alive. He changes us because he is alive. The very first proof of the resurrection the power, if you like, of the resurrection is the transforming of people's lives and their experiences. They simply would not live their lives as they did and couldn't live their lives as they did in the face of the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. The second witness that Paul talks about here is the transforming power of God's word. He says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose on the third day, according to the scriptures. In other words, what he's saying here is that this truth, this power that is there in the word of God is capable of transforming lives and it's capable of enabling us to believe. And if we were to open this book, and if we were to read it with an open heart and an open mind, it would be transforming in our lives. I know that from my own experience. I used to read the Bible before I came to Christ. And it was the Word of God that brought that revelation. It was the Word of God that brought that transformation into my life. God's Word has power to change lives. James 1.18 said, He brought us forth by the word of God. In other words, we were 
new life came into us through God's word. And in 1 Peter 1, 23, we are all born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. In other words, it's the word of God. It's the testimony that's given through his word that actually brings faith into us, that brings life into us. Listen to these words of Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 63. He says, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and of life. These words are full of the spirit and of life. And they are able, therefore, to transform us, to change us. The scriptures throughout the Bible speak about Jesus. And Jesus fulfills prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. One such that you might know very well is Psalm 22. Let's go back to it. Psalm 22. And it reminds us of just how powerfully Jesus is able to bring all of this as a fulfilment of what was given before. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? My God, my God, I cry out to you. He says, I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men, despised by the people. Well, we've just read that. As you brought me out of the womb, you made me trust in you. And, and although he says um, that my bones stare out, if you like, he says also that you have delivered me. I will declare your name and you are never far from me. Jesus fulfills the prophecies of scripture about him. And he enables us in the word of God to be able to believe on him and trust in him. And so Paul says, listen, not just the power of the cross, but also the power of his word are testimonies to the fact that Jesus Christ is alive and we can trust in him. The third witness, Paul says, is the witness of the church. He said he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. In other words, he says that the testimony of the church, of ordinary Christians, ordinary men and women of God, is powerful and is evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. Dr. Derek Prince, who's gone on to be with the Lord now, is someone's teaching that I, I listened to a lot when I was younger and instructed me a lot from the word of God. But I, I remember listening to his account of how he came to Christ when he was younger. He was um, called up into the army during the Second World War and he was in a, um, a barrack room and he decided because he was a student of philosophy that he would take um, a book with him to study philosophically, so to speak. But he was only allowed one book, so he thought he would take the largest and heaviest one that he could find that was philosophical, and he took the Bible. And as he started to read through the Bible and started to understand it, he looked at, first of all, to try and analyze it philosophically. But the power of those words and the power of the truth started to impact upon his life. And he says, and he gives an account of how, on one occasion, one night, he just pulled up a stall near the window of his barrack room. And while the others were sleeping, he started to pray. And as he was praying, he felt really frustrated because he just felt he just couldn't break through. He just couldn't get through. And he said he was near to tears at this point. But as he was praying, suddenly he's, he felt his arms were just lifting up. 
And suddenly he started to feel the presence of God, the power of God in his heart and his life. The presence of God seemed to be all around him. And it filled him with joy. He said he just felt that he just felt really heavy. He just collapsed onto the floor and just started to praise the Lord. His roommate came up to him, asking him if he was all right, and managed to get him back onto his bed. But he felt almost drunk in the spirit. There was a powerful transformation in his life as he discovered that Jesus Christ is alive. And by his spirit, he was able to connect with God and feel the presence of God. And all of that came about because he started to study the word of God. And as the word of God entered into his spirit, he became more and more open to the touch and the power of God in his life. Paul says that these testimonies, the the power of of Jesus' blood and of his sacrifice on the cross, the testimony of scripture that speaks of Jesus, that tells the truth of who he is. And finally, the witness of Christians who testify of their encounter of God and of their lives transformed. He says all three of these are evidence to you that Jesus Christ is indeed alive. So we're going to pray now, and um, and I'd love us to be able to pray together so that we can just acknowledge who Jesus is and acknowledge what has happened. But I also pray that if you don't know the Lord, or you're just maybe looking at this and you're just curious, or you just want to find out more, but you feel the Lord touching, you feel something of the presence of God, and there's something in your heart that wants to respond to him. I just pray that you respond during this time of prayer with me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these words of Paul. It says that there are testimonies, if you like. There are witnesses, powerful witnesses to your resurrection and life. And that the power of the cross that transformed the mockery into faith, the power of your blood that redeems us and changes us, the power of your word that can transform us too and bring about new faith and new life in us as we absorb your word, which is a a spiritual transformation, not just knowledge into our minds. And the power too of hearing Christian stories of lives changed and new life coming. We pray that those witnesses might witness to our spirit and that we would respond to you and thank you for all that you are and all that you've done. But if, we, Lord, we're not sure and we're still a little bit uncertain, a bit like Thomas in the room, that in some ways we'll be able to reach out and touch the wounds of Christ. We'll be able to touch you and sense your presence and and your your reality and come to that place where we too will say, my Lord and my God. And we pray, Father, that you will speak to us. We pray that, Jesus, you become manifest in our lives and that our lives, as well as the lives of those before us, are transformed also by your loving grace through the victorious and living Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Rob. It's time now for us to say the creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, 
he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, you may have noticed now we have moved from the garden tomb to the gardens of Gethsemane, because it was here on the night that he was betrayed that Jesus prayed to his Father. And I thought it was a good time and a good place for us to be for our prayers this morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you rejoicing in the good news of all that your Son, our Saviour, has done, so that we might be free and live with you forever. We praise you that through his resurrection we know that we can be forgiven, and just as he rose from the grave, so can we also. Lord, the joy of this day means so much, but even we can't begin to grasp the height and the breadth of what you've done for us and the price that you paid simply because you love us. Grant that every day of our lives we will come to understand more clearly and love you more dearly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our families and friends and for all those for whom this is just another day. For our children and grandchildren who see it as just a time for enjoying chocolate and an overabundance of Easter eggs. And it's for their sake, Father, we implore you that once again you would rend the heavens and come down with revival power to restore our land to one where your name is both honoured and revered. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all who are suffering today and carrying the burdens of sickness, grief, anxiety or guilt. We pray that you will guide them towards freedom, wholeness and faith in you as a loving God who seeks to serve us and save us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray earnestly for your church in this land, which now honours and fears man more than it does you. Please restore a godly leadership to the church, that we may be led by men and women of principle and courage, but most of all whose hearts are on fire for you. Restore your church, we implore you, as you are such a great and wonderful God. Bless our vicar Rob Grinsaw and his wife Sarah. Lord, we pray earnestly that they may be filled with the fire of your truth and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We say together, teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labour and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing we do your will. Lord, in your mercy, we ask that you accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And now, as we prepare our hearts to gather with Rob around the Lord's table, we're going to sing the hymn, Man of Sorrows, What a Name.
the Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you've created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh as your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin. He lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. And so he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and of wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as you shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. And as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people, and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you, his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen.
Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, thank you, Rob. We now come to our final hymn for today. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon the throne. you for being with me today on this special Easter day when we know in our heart of hearts that Christ has risen and that death for us is just going to be a change of address. May the Lord encourage you this day. May it be a special one for you and I hope perhaps that we'll be able to join together at the same time next week for another service of worship and Holy Communion. But until we do, may I say, from all of us here at St Luke's, from Rob and his wife Sarah, from Andy and June Edney, from Paul Whittles, from Dave Williams, and all whose names I can't remember, we send you our love and our greetings on this Easter day. Look after yourself, and as always, keep safe. Goodbye, and may God richly bless you. Thank mm -hmm. you.